baby historian. Today we're going to talk about the cultural nature of crawling. As an American, crawling is considered a developmental milestone in my culture. As it is in many Western cultures, crawling has been given credit for everything from the development of depth perception to strengthening muscles and changing the shape of the spine to allow walking, as well as social and emotional development associated with independence, which is highly valued. Early crawling is celebrated and delayed or skipped crawling is claimed to be linked with everything from autism to behavioral problems. Parents and caregivers are made to believe that they have some control over when a baby learns to crawl. So when crawling is thought to be delayed, it's considered a failing of the parents. To promote crawling, babies are left to lie on the floor surrounded by brightly colored, often electronic plastic toys advertised to speed physical or intellectual development. This floor time is considered important for exercising baby's arms and legs, neck and trunk muscles so that they can learn to lift their heads and roll over, both of which are considered developmental milestones that precede crawling. There is a competitive element to developmental milestones, both figuratively and literal. Baby races are a common entertainment at basketball games and fairs. The emphasis on parental influence on milestone attainment is lucrative. Those who profit from the sale of baby gear and toys are often the loudest proponents of crawling. In 2016, a patent application published in Obesity Fitness and Wellness Week for a crawling garment designed to create friction on hard surface flooring went full diva. A baby crawling on rugs or carpet were liable to get lung disease, but letting a baby struggle to crawl on hard surface flooring could result in a non-crawler, which would lead to a neurological delay causing behavioral and learning problems later in life, and that milestones were sequential. Skipping crawling would effectively ruin a child's life. In another publication, Mechanical Engineering, Sunil Agarwal was trying to drum up investments in his idea for a robotic platform that would allow disabled infants to experience crawling because independent locomotion is what turns babies into children again implying that missing the experience of crawling would cause learning difficulties later in life. Aside from crawling gardens and robots, there's also the cost associated with creating a safe environment for infants to be on the floor and to crawl around. For some families, this may mean moving or remodeling. For others, it may simply mean baby-proofing with gates and bumpers, outlet covers, and cord managers. And if you regularly use infant carriers, you may have heard the unsolicited warning, they'll never learn to walk if you carry them all the time. To which you should say, Karen, your kid's never gonna learn to walk if you push them around all the time. But you're not a jerk, so you just stare at them until they become uncomfortable and leave. Anywho, this unsolicited warning underscores a cultural concern that infants who are carried aren't getting enough time on the floor to learn crawling and therefore will never learn to walk. I mean, without crawling, their spine won't be in the right shape, right? And no depth perception and learning disabilities? <sighs> but what if this is nonsense? What if crawling and other tummy time-based milestones are cultural constructs based in large part by the lack of carrying. What if babies aren't given floor time and aren't allowed to crawl, but are carried all the time? Will they ever learn to walk? The best way to test this is to find cultures that didn't or don't allow crawling and see how they've gotten on. In addition, we'll learn about other cultures that do allow crawling to get a wider perspective on this brief phase of human locomotion. The first place to stop is Europe the origin of Western culture. Throughout Western history, crawling was seen as animalistic, and along with other animalistic behaviors, the role of a good caregiver was to break the child of or prevent such bad habits. Infants in the Middle Ages were swaddled and often bound to boards or cradles throughout their infancy, allowed to have legs free when old enough to practice standing or toddling using walkers. Aside from the very poor and possibly the very wealthy, most European infants in the thousand year span of the medieval era were not getting tummy time or crawling around. Allowing infants to crawl around is a relatively recent trend even in the United States. Less than a century ago, 
an infant care manual published by the Children's Bureau, stressed the need to keep babies off the floor for fears of drafts and dirt, not to mention the dangers of fireplaces. In the early 1990s, researcher Alma Gottlieb stayed with the bank people of the Cote d'Ivory in Western Africa. In her book, The Afterlife is Where We Come From, she described their ideas about crawling. Bang babies are allowed to crawl, but they need to crawl with their bellies up. Creeping or slithering with the belly on the ground rather than crawling with the stomach raised is considered unacceptable by bang parents, who do all they can to reorient a baby who seems inclined to slither rather than crawl. This slithering crawl is considered a bad omen, or a tit. And a tet can include infants whose development is not in line with the cultural norms, for example, an infant with teeth before age one, or crawling with the belly on the ground, or crawling later than other babies for their age. These kinds of bad omens are associated with the death of the infant's relatives. To encourage crawling, a bang mother may locate a left-handed person who then finds a shrub growing on a mound both left-handed people and hills are considered to contain mystical powers, though in opposite directions. Left-handed people are inauspicious, and shrubs on mounds are considered auspicious. The left-handed person uproots the plant and gives it to the baby's mother, who crushes it well with chili pepper and then uses it as an enema for her infant. And the bang routinely give their babies enemas in order to encourage bowel movements uh, at a convenient time. Bang babies get dirty crawling in the dirt, but they are bathed twice a day until they learn to walk independently. There is a concern about a sickness called the dirt cough, but it's not from dirt on the ground, but rather an unseen pollution from the touch of an adult who's had sex the previous night and not yet bathed themselves. From Judy DeLoach and Alma Gottlieb's book, A World of Babies, which, in which they create and imagine childcare manuals for different cultures and time periods based on historical or ethnographic research, they created a baby care manual for people living in central Anatolia, Turkey, during the 1980s. Most of the time, babies are held by someone. We don't usually let them crawl around very much. Indeed, I am not sure all babies even learn to crawl. They are hardly ever put down on the ground outside because it is just too dirty and they might pick up something dirty and put it in their mouth. In the house, you can let them sit and crawl around on the floor from time to time because the floors are swept clean several times a day. They will find all kinds of things to play with, but you must be careful. I have seen babies playing with knives and scissors and that can be very dangerous. In the Six Cultures Collection on Child Rearing, psychologists Leigh Minturn and anthropologist John T. Hitchcock were part of the Cornell University's Cornell India Project. In their ethnography, they describe attitudes about crawling in Rajput culture of Kalapur, which is southwest of Mumbai, in the 1960s. A baby spends little time crawling. Sometimes, unattended, he may set off across the courtyard on his own, but someone usually grabs him before he gets far. Since the women do most of the work on the floor, the food dishes, grain dishes, and so on are usually lying somewhere. This makes a crawling baby something of a nuisance, although there is little that can hurt him except for the hearth fire and an occasional spinning wheel, spindle, or knife. If the infant is crawling towards some area where it is not supposed to be or playing with some object which, is, which it is not supposed to have, an adult simply removes either the baby or the object rather than attempting to coax the baby to give up the object or crawl away. And if the baby is being stubborn about getting into trouble, such as returning to something they've been removed from, the adults may use physical punishment like slapping the baby. In doing research for this project, I looked for the earliest depiction of infant crawling in art history that I could find, and honestly, there isn't much. But there are Omlik infant statues, one of which is crawling. The Olmec culture had a tradition of life-size infant statues dating from between 1200 to 800 BCE, and the civilization as a whole flourished between 1500 and 400 BCE, and are famous for the colossal stone head sculptures. It is unknown if the infant statues represent an idealized form of infanthood or if they represent actual high-status infants. They are believed to have been used in effigy of real infants in sacrificial rituals. James Doyle of the Met Museum writes, 
In, in some cases, the ceramic effigies may have served as substitutes for actual infants in a sacrificial or dedicatory ritual, as there is compelling evidence of Omlek infant sacrifice or ceremonial burials. Child sacrifice is never a pleasant subject, however, the fact is that ancient Omlek civilization placed infancy in high regard, that infants were allowed to crawl, and that the crawling sage of infancy was valued enough to be immortalized in their art. The preoccupation of Omlek peoples with child rearing and the mythological connections between the life cycles of infants and agriculture transcend time and space. Another contributor to the Six Cultures collection is that of Thomas and Hatsumi Maretsky's study of Taira in the northeast coast of Okinawa in 1950s and 60s Japan. In this culture, infants are nearly always carried on the back of their siblings or grandmother. Crawling is generally not allowed because ain't nobody got time for that. In spite of the fact that he is capable of crawling or learning to crawl within the second half year of his life, he is kept on the back. He does not protest or clamor to be put down. He seems to prefer being carried to being left to crawl. Caretakers are too busy with work or play to let the child crawl about freely, so there is no crawling stage in Tyra. Older siblings are too involved in play to sit and patiently watch a crawler. In fact, the only children who were allowed to crawl were those of the wealthy fishermen's wives who didn't have chores or work to do. They had the leisure to sit and watch their babies crawling. A mother who sits and plucks sweet potato leaves off the vines for hog feed works more efficiently with the baby on her back. Crawling around on loose floorboards near the fire pit or over the edge of the raised floor, the child would require constant attention. In this environment, there was no floor time or ability to practice crawling, and certainly no encouragement from caregivers. Yet the infants still knew how to crawl. There are many stories of infants taking off the moment they were removed from their strap carry, much to the horror of their caregivers. A big sister was playing with her friends with the baby strapped to her back. The baby was tall enough so that it could touch the ground with its feet and bounce, causing the big sister to lose her balance while she was squatting to play. After six unsuccessful attempts to get the baby to stop, the big sister unstrapped the baby and let it crawl. Another kid cried out that the baby had eaten dirt and the big sister, knowing she'd be severely punished for letting the baby crawl around, rushed over to flush the baby's mouth out and strap it back on her back. Another time, a mother was working with sharp bamboo and a knife to make baskets when an older sibling brought the baby in for nursing. The mother pushed away the sharp objects to feed the baby. When finished, she put the baby down and called to the child, but the child had run to get a drink. The baby went for the knife, the mother grabbed it away, then the baby went for the sharp bamboo. The mother had had quite enough of this and yelled at the kid to come back and get the baby on their back and to go play. Another kid had put a baby down in the courtyard of the grandmother's house because it was the grandmother's turn to carry the baby. While unsupervised, the baby peed on the ground and then crawled around in the urine mud mixture. The grandmother came out to find the filthy baby and she was disgusted that the child let the baby crawl and upset that she had to bathe it before strapping it on her back and going about her day. Another entry in the world of babies was from Bali in Indonesia, a culture famous for never letting a baby touch the ground for the first 108 days after birth, when the Naibutan ceremony is held marking the first time the baby's feet touch the ground. During the day, your baby will be carried by someone most of the time, even after he or she can crawl. It is base for a baby to crawl on the ground like an animal. Hold the baby in your arms or in a sling around your body as you go about your daily business. Your infant can stay in the sling even while asleep, although you may want to pull a cloth over the child's face. If you have put your child down to do some work, another person, your husband, a sibling, a child caretaker, grandparent, aunt, uncle, cousin, or neighbor should hold the child. Everyone loves to hold a baby. Another from the world of babies, Sophia Parasakos, shares the advice and experience of old law Walpiri culture she gave to her granddaughter. The Walpiri are an aboriginal culture living in the central desert in Australia. Before returning to your daily responsibilities after the birth, you will need something for carrying your infant. In my day, we used an oblong, bowl-shaped baby carrier carved from wood called a paraja or a kulaman, lined with blankets. Shoulder straps attached to the ends allowed me to carry my baby comfortably along my side. I found this helpful as I did my chores. 
You should hardly ever put your baby onto the ground. Instead, you or another person should hold the baby most of the time. I find it unthinkable to leave your baby alone. If you are a young mother, other women should keep an eye on you to make sure you do not mishandle your baby. Towards the end of the first year, babies begin crawling and walking. Even if we could keep them in the wooden sling, they would have outgrown it. In the old days, at this point, it became difficult to bring the child along to search for food. Our husbands were often hunting during the day. In any case, they were not usually responsible for young boys or for girls of any age. Fortunately, we could count on our female relatives for help. When we needed to gather food, we could leave our child with our sisters, mothers, or grandmothers. Of course, there were times to reciprocate and look after their children while they collected food. In this culture, crawling was discouraged in so much as leaving your baby on the ground was considered mistreatment, but they recognized that at some point, the child is going to be too big and active to be carried or otherwise prevented from crawling, even though it presents a problem for foraging. So they used cooperative breeding, in which other members of the group care for each other's children, taking time away from gathering food to, to ensure everyone's survival. In Barbara Rogoff's book, The Cultural Nature of Human Development, she describes the attitudes toward crawling and walking in Wogyo, New Guinea, and how cultural practices affect development of infant mobility. In Wogyo, New Guinea, infants are not allowed to crawl and discouraged from walking until nearly two years of age so that they know how to take care of themselves and avoid dangers before moving about freely. An infant who showed an interest in moving about would be immediately picked up or put firmly into a corner. Toward the end of the second year, children learned to walk well within two or three days. She quotes an excerpt from Hogben's 1943 publication on infant development in New Guinea. No one seems to think that active encouragement of any kind is necessary. When I told the natives how we coax our babies to stand at a much earlier age, they admitted that such methods might be suitable where there was no fireplace or veranda from which to tumble, but they openly laughed at me for speaking of teaching children to walk. If a child walks, it's of its own accord, they said, once it has reached the appropriate stage of growth. I would be saying next that trees had to be instructed in how to bear fruit. We have seen that there are many cultures that did not or do not allow crawling, and their infants learn to walk at around the same time as in cultures that encourage crawling, sometimes sooner, but not that that matters as I'll get to in a moment. We've also seen that crawling is instinctive in healthy infants. It doesn't require floor time or practice or special toys or exercises. The babies in Tyra or Turkey, Central Australia or Bali were never allowed tummy time, let alone free range to practice crawling, Yet in brief moments, when left to their own devices, they were crawling independently. The global alternative to floor time, and therefore crawling, seems to be carrying. So let's compare the claims made about crawling, as well as other floor-based milestones, with carrying to understand how infants in non-crawling cultures are able to walk, develop depth perception, and so on. When it comes to physical development, it's the old chicken or the egg riddle. Pathways Magazine and blog claim that infants develop neck curvature from learning to hold their heads up in tummy time and that lumbar lordosis with the practice of crawling, but this is inaccurate. The development of curves precede the milestone. The milestone doesn't cause the curves. Otherwise, we would see large swathes of the human population through history unable to stand or walk. The physical maturation of the infant's spine happens regardless of culture, whereas floor time and crawling do not. It's just as the people from Wogio told Hogman in 1943, babies learn to walk when they're developed enough. As for depth perception, infant eyesight changes are largely due to the maturity of the brain not from the experience of looking into the distance while crawling. Besides, infants who are carried are more likely to get the experience of looking into the distance than infants who spend their time on the floor. In 1978, a study to test the visual cliff on pre-locomotory infants was done showing that infants begin to develop depth perception in the months prior to the average age of crawling, four to five months. Again, the development precedes the milestone. Crawling doesn't cause depth perception, and depth perception just happens to be getting better during the time most infants in crawling cultures begin crawling. 
Scientists should understand that correlation doesn't equal causation, but it's very difficult to get beyond one's cultural lens if you've never encountered or heard of a culture without crawling. Healthy infants are constantly practicing their coordination. It's not exclusive to crawling. And babies who are carried upright get the benefit of moving in space with their caregiver's body long before they would be able to begin crawling. Muscle strengthening is the same as coordination. Healthy babies are getting stronger as they age. Floor time infants will develop muscle strength from trying to look up from the floor and then by trying to move themselves around while infants who are carried get an opportunity to tone neck and core muscles as they move with the body of their caregiver. However, it is important to recognize that walking requires more than muscle strength or spinal curves. It has to do with body proportions too. Throughout the first year, an infant's trunk and limbs are growing faster than their heads. Combined with spinal maturity, this allows for bipedal locomotion. Rogoff explained that differences in communities' values and expectations underlie varying parental efforts to help children learn skills. What kind of values and expectations go into efforts to teach babies to crawl? One of the most important ones in my culture is that of independence. It is an unattainable cultural ideal based on the belief that people can and should become independent from others in order to become successful. But the fact is, is that no one is independent from other people, least of all infants. Some confuse an infant's curiosity for independence, but crawling doesn't make infants curious and it certainly doesn't make them independent. In fact, I would argue that crawling makes infants more dependent on caregivers to either supervise their movements to keep them out of danger and or to baby-proof the environment. Mobile babies are more work, as I and the mothers from Tyra and Mogio can attest. Crawling is touted as a primary means of social interaction for babies, and this makes sense in cultures that isolate children based on their age and physical abilities. Most infant holders, such as swings, bouncy seats, car seats, and strollers, are designed to only hold one infant. So unless the infant is crawling on the floor with other crawling babies, they will have limited social interactions with other children or adults. However, with carrying, especially in the cultures where it is common, Infants are carried by multiple members of the community, from children through elders. They receive social interaction not only from their caregivers, but from the people interacting with their caregivers. In Tyra, the infants are introduced to their entire village from the back of their grandmother or their older siblings, well before they are a year old. Crawling has also been touted as a way for babies to learn about their world and that missing crawling could set the stage for learning disorders. Yet carried babies are getting a brain full of social learning. The verbal and body language of the people that interact with both the caregiver and themselves, as well as the passersby, babies are taking in all the information about their world at home and their community at the same visual level as their caregiver. Now compare that with the floor level of a baby-proofed room. Of course, babies will learn whatever their environment, but if learning is considered a major component of why crawling is so important, then it falls far behind the opportunities provided by carrying. Now back to why it doesn't really matter when or whether a baby reaches floor-based milestones or crawls, or when they can learn to walk. Tummy time was initially developed as a means to correct the developmental delays caused by the Back to Sleep program. But as early as 1998, researchers already found that the delayed milestones had no effect on walking or subsequent development, as the prone sleepers learned to walk at around the same time as babies in the control group. Because there does not seem to be a difference in attainment of the walking skills or of some of the 18-month-old milestones, this difference in milestone attainment may be transient. And developmental milestones are not, as Cognikid's crawling garment inventor insisted, sequential. Even in cultures that encourage crawling, many babies skip crawling and go straight to walking with no negative consequences. Research published in 2013 showed that the age babies learn to walk was inconsequential for future development. They concluded that children who start walking turn out later to be neither more intelligent nor more well-coordinated. The researchers found no correlation between the age at which children reach these motor milestones and their performance in the intelligence and motor tests between the age of 7 and 18. In short, by the time they reach school age, children who start walking later than others are just as well-coordinated and intelligent as those who were up on their feet early. 
With all this said, I want to emphasize that I don't have a problem with floor time or crawling. It can be fun and rewarding for babies and their caregivers, even if it is more work. And it's a great way for pets and babies to interact. What I do have a problem with are predatory marketing claims, unhealthy competition for transient and inconsequential milestone attainment, and inaccurate recommendations from well-meaning but culturally biased healthcare providers. While tummy time was initially developed to correct milestone delays, it was continued to be recommended even after the delays were shown to be transient in order to prevent plagiocephaly or flat head syndrome, which is a cosmetic condition, not dangerous, just a symptom of a culture that has avoided carrying babies for hundreds of years. Babies are left to lie down prone or be reclined most of the time, and with fears of SIDS since the 90s, parents are unwilling to allow babies to change positions so plagiocephaly is the result. Tummy time is a means to prevent it. To be clear, the encouragement of floor time and crawling in a culture that doesn't carry is probably a good idea for the well-being of the infant. It might be their only opportunity to get exercise, to look into the distance, to explore their environment, to physically interact with their caregiver or siblings, but it is entirely cultural. And if someone tries to convince you otherwise, you should ask yourself what they're trying to sell you. For example, when companies like Fisher-Price try to sell products for tummy time claiming it will make baby stronger and smarter, or CogniKids claiming that without their product, kids might never crawl and develop a neurological delay. For caregivers that choose to carry, carrying time as an alternative to floor time should be recognized by infant care experts and healthcare providers. Parents who don't want to or can't clutter their homes with floor time toys or child-proofing gear for financial, space, or ethical reasons shouldn't be told that they have to for their child's development. When Fisher-Price had the rock and play recall in 2019, there was nowhere for the items to be recycled without consumers having the tools to disassemble the metal from plastic parts. And even then, not all components could be recycled. And I doubt that environmentalism or worker welfare had much consideration in its manufacture. These are issues that more people are considering before making purchases, and they shouldn't feel that becoming a parent prevents them from being conscientious consumers. This goes back to the point that the environment and wealth of a culture has a lot to do with the development of crawling. Many of the places that did not have a crawling stage cited that it was too dangerous or dirty to allow a baby to crawl around. While in the West, most families enjoy such a high standard of living that crawling is considered the biological norm. It may be a long shot, but less emphasis on floor time and more emphasis on carrying might be a way of making raising an infant more sustainable for more families. Now there is the issue of delayed milestones as a diagnostic tool. Most American parents will be familiar with the advice on milestone charts that if your baby isn't doing blank by age blank, then you should see your healthcare provider. This is why I've emphasized healthy infants throughout this video. It is important that conditions like hypotonia, which means low tone and can be noticed in babies who follow things with their eyes without moving their heads, or hypertonia, which means high tone, can be recognized in babies with flexed, stiff joints, or if a baby seems to unlearn how to do things. Any of these signs should be referred to a healthcare provider as soon as possible. But it's important to recognize that one, delayed milestones may be a symptom of developmental disorder, but they are not the cause. Two, floor time is not required to recognize these symptoms. In fact, caregivers who carry infants often will probably notice these symptoms sooner. Floor time and the floor-based developmental milestones should be recognized as cultural. That is, meant for a culture that does not carry infants. Healthy infants will be able to crawl when they have reached a certain level of physical maturity, and the same goes for walking. And in the long run, when an otherwise healthy infant learns to crawl or walk has no influence on their later life. So just enjoy your baby, whether on the floor or in your arms or in a carrier, and know that they will be able to crawl and or walk when they are ready, whether you're ready or not. If you enjoy this kind of research, please consider supporting The Baby Historian on Patreon. And thank you to my ongoing patrons. I couldn't do this work without your support. I hope you enjoyed.
slide off my face. It's sweaty. I'm sweaty. Why am I wearing a sweater? Okay, whatever. That is the most I can remember at any one time, and even then I failed. Okay, was I gonna say anything else?